Thank you. This isn't perspiration, it's just sweat. <laughs> I sweat more than you, but it's fun. Um, I, you know, I thought it would be interesting if, if, to do an instrumental set, if, if, instead of just playing instrumentals, if I could give you a little history behind each of these songs. And uh, Once I'm gone, uh, most of all the players I worked with, you know, are, are, they're no longer alive, or, or the steel players are all gone. Uh, the, you know, this, there's a lot of uh, wonderful players that came before me. Uh, well, at least two, Buddy Evans and Jimmy Day, and then and Pete Drake came along and, and became the top session guy. Then I came along in 64 and became a, a big session guy. And then we had, oops, uh, now I can't hold my picks. Thank you very much. Then Weldon Byrie cut uh, I'll Come Running and, and uh, Once a Day with Connie Smith. And he became a major player. And we had Hal Rugg and then John, the great John Huey. And, and uh, Buddy Emmons, of course, but he went to California and worked with Roger Miller during the great era of the of the creation of what became the National Sound, uh, unfortunately. But but um, I, I, I'd like to do this in honor of all those great players who are gone, so because I miss them, they were all my friends. But once once I'm gone, you know, the history will be gone of this stuff. Uh, we have uh, two or three guys that still could do it and still remember it, and that's Charlie McCoy and Pete Roberts and myself. And, it gets pretty sketchy beyond that. But I, that's why I wanted to give you a little history of these songs, if, because I was involved with each one of my playing. And um, uh, Russ and I are going to play a song now, though, that, um, that wasn't a number one. And, uh, actually, it was an instrumental I wrote <laughs> about two years ago. <laughs> but it, it, it's an interesting instrumental, and I, I think uh, it may be, uh, as far as steel guitar instrumentals go, it's the best one I've ever written. And, uh, before any of you astronomy buffs out there don't, don't critique me now, because I know that the two planets in our solar system, which don't have moons, are Venus and um, and Mercury. So uh, the, the title of the song that was given to me by someone else, uh, it's uh, called Venus Moon.
much. I, I really appreciate that. It's a joy to get to do this. I should do it more often, I guess, because... Uh, yeah. <laughs> do that. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm having too much fun to play much music. <laughs> uh, Sandra and I travel a lot. And, and, uh, my sweetheart, she just got back from Florida a few hours ago, and uh, she made it out, thank goodness. And, uh, but um, uh, the music is um, largely, you know, I mean, most of the music now is, uh, has passed on to these gentlemen, and uh, the music I play is sort of a lost start, I guess, in a, in a sense. I mean, there's some great players, there's some incredible players here. Eddie Dunlop is here, and, uh, and, and just... Uh, the newer players are probably as a, as a in total better than the technically the, than the musicians of, of the era I played all the guitar players and everything. Uh, Guthrie Traps here, my gosh, he's one of the greatest players on the planet. I've never worked with anybody who plays more incredibly than he does. So uh, the 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 uh, thing is passed on to newer generation. You got great players, of, uh, the greatest in the world. Of course, Paul Franklin, who, who's uh, the number one player and has been for many years now, and, and, and Tommy White, who plays at the opera. So, so the steel guitar is surviving and will survive. I, I don't know what uh, direction it'll take, I'll, uh, but I'll be uh, enjoying uh, watching it, uh, whatever it transforms into it. But everybody who learns to play has to go through the, the learning process of what we did in the 60s and, and 70s because that's where the the foundation was laid for the, for what's happened now for country music. This next song is um, uh, one that um, I had, um, I, when I started doing sessions, I felt like the tuning, in fact, I knew it was, it was incomplete. There was a missing element. The, the, the math didn't match the theory. And, and uh, I, I don't know if everybody else thought it was complete, but I, I would get into situations and traps on sessions where I couldn't, fluidly get out of it and I and I knew something was missing. One morning I woke up in 1967 and, and the light bulb turned on and I, I had this pedal installed on my guitar and it, here's all it does is knee lever right here on my left knee and it raises two strings, just the E strings, a half tone. But it opened not just a new territory, it opened a whole new universe of playing and, and uh, I was lucky enough to, the morning I had it put on my guitar I, was in a session with Billy Sherrill, with Tammy Wynette, and, and he heard me fooling around with this sliding, just trying to find the positions. And you can't do that without that pedal. So uh, anyway, uh, he came over and said, what are you doing? And I he said, I haven't heard that. And I told, explained to him, and he said, well, that's gonna be our sound. So he, for this record, he said, play these notes. And he gave me these five notes, two, uh, three A notes and two F sharp notes. He said, make magic out of that now. So we, that became uh, the intro for D I B O R C E.
But uh, after that record came out, of course it was number one by Tammy went in everything. It wouldn't matter if I was on the record or not. Pete Drake was usually the uh, first call for Billy Sherrill and uh, Pete and I were always double booked on everything. So he got on sessions. For instance, I missed the Lynn Anderson uh, career song, Rose Garden, the first record I ever missed was Lynn Anderson. So Pete Drake played on But I played on this one because he was already booked somewhere else. And, um, but within two or three months after this record was cut, just in this dental, all the steel players around the world had this pedal because it became, it's, it's put on automatically on the E9, the commercial tuning for, for all the steel guitars made now. It's just, it was, uh, there are other pedals that have been added subsequently, but but uh, they're not as essential as this. This is part of the tuning and it was just a simple thing that we'd overlooked for a long time, but I'm glad it uh, exists now. Um, this next song, another guy uh, came along in, early in my career, and uh, a fellow named Aubrey Mayhew had a label called Little Darling Records, and um, he was an eccentric guy, man. He was uh, brilliant from New York, and he ran a little label called Ambassador Records. They, everything they cut, they sold for a dollar and fifty cents in the record stores in Zayers and Kmart and all the places of the era. And he, he decided to form this label, Little Darling Records, and. He told me he had two goals in mind. One, the first was to make this singer he'd found, he named him himself. Uh, his, his name was originally uh, Don Lytle, then he became Donnie Young uh, on rec Decca Records. And, but he became, as everybody knows him uh, subsequently today, uh, Johnny Paycheck. Uh, that was a, actually the name of a Chicago middleweight boxer that never was a major boxer, but that was the, where the name came from. And Mayhew gave him that name. And, it was spelled differently uh, than the guy, uh, the paycheck was. But, but anyway, uh, he had two uh, stated goals, he told me. When I was leader on all the sessions. And he said the first goal was he was going to make Johnny Paycheck a star, and he was going to make me the next Jerry Bird or Speedy West. And I said, but I don't want to be Speedy West or Jerry Bird. I want to be me. He said, no, I'm going to make you. So he, he did something that was not done in the middle 1960s. He, he put my name on all the Little Darling records, uh, whether it was the singles or albums. It, it always had steel guitar on Lloyd Green. And uh, eventually all the labels started giving label credits for musicians, which should have been early on. But but this song is one of the first ones we cut with Paycheck. And, and uh, Billy Sherrill later, you know, cut, uh, take this job and shove it. And uh, uh, great stuff with Paycheck. But, but I think all the Little Darling stuff was really the essential Johnny Paycheck, because we were early outlaws, actually, the music was. Uh, I'll tell you one little more anecdote about Paycheck before I play it. We, uh, he was doing an interview one night with Eddie Stubbs on WSM, and, and Eddie said, well, Johnny, give me the answer. I, I, I need to understand how, how this worked between you and Lloyd. What was the synergy that made this uh, that stuff happen on the Darling? And, and he said, Paycheck leaned across the table and just kind of stared at him and said, well, I'll tell you what happened, Eddie. He said, Lloyd played with an attitude and I sang with an attitude. And I thought that, that, that explained it better than I could have. And we did. We were hungry. We wanted to, to be noticed. And, and uh, the little darling stuff was not appreciated by the major producers in Nashville. I can tell you, uh, uh, I can say it because they are no longer around, but I was, I, was, I was recording Bradley's Bar one day with Owen Bradley. And, he evidently had heard a little darling record on the way in. And, you know, all the Chet Atkins records were perfect. All of Owen Bradley's were perfect. I mean, they, and they were great records. But but I think they were a little offended because we, we cut some rough music on Little Darling. It, it had mistakes, all kind of stuff. But, but it had magical qualities, some of it too. But but Owen Bradley came up to me and he said, I want to ask you a question, Lord. He said, when you guys go in the studio cutting that little garden and stuff, are y'all serious or just wasting studio time? <laughs> and he was serious. And I had to think to it because I, I didn't, couldn't say what I really wanted to say. <laughs> you know, but I finally looked up and I said, well, you know, and I, I said, we, we're serious. We're deadly serious when we cut it. So he accepted that and walked away. But, but this is one of those crazy songs we did and it had a new little steel sound. If I can play it, it's, it gets way up out of the uh, front range to start. It's almost like flying a plane blindfolded. It's called uh, Jukebox Charlie.
it, it sounds simple, and it really is, except that intro. <laughs> it's a tough thing to play. Yeah, and he's still there to tell you. Um, but it, it was one of those moments, and uh, we did it. Um, this next song is, uh, is uh, one I wrote, and uh, the only other one I'm going to play that I wrote. I'm playing it because Russ wants me to play it. It's, um, it's um, a song I put on uh, instrumental. I, I had, I mean, most of you people wouldn't know this, but I, I did 17 instrumental albums, actually, and there was a time when they played instrumentals on the radio, you know. I mean, they played Chet Atkins, Bruce Randolph, Troy McCoy, Floyd Kramer. They played me. They played everybody who was... Uh, Prominent instrumentalist, and, and suddenly after uh, the deregulation of radio occurred, and the corporate people started buying them up, instrumentals were the first thing that disappeared. They, one day there was no instrumentals left. But this was in an era when I was getting a lot of air play, and uh, and I cut this song on an album in 1971. It's called Midnight Silence. You know, I haven't, I haven't played a lot of this stuff until I started rehearsing again in 30 or 40 years and some of it more. But um, I, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't at least do uh, one song from a guy that was a major part of my career, too, uh, the great Charlie Pride. Um, there's uh, some great stories about how he became a country artist. I mean, it, it was uh, during an era of civil unrest in America, you know, in 1966. And uh, we didn't have any 
black country artist. So, but Jack Clement called me one day. I was a leader on all his sessions at that time, and and uh, he he asked me. He said, Do you, "Would you have any problem cutting with a, with a black singer?" I said, "Can he sing?" <laughs> he said, "Yeah, he can sing." I said, well, "What the hell? Let's go to studio recording." And uh, you know, musicians are colorblind. I don't know why anybody would ever think that there was any problem. But anyway. We went in and we cut a, two songs. Now, Cowboy was a smart guy, you know, and uh, he, he, uh, he was covering himself. We, we did four songs in three-hour sessions in those days. So it was a three-hour session. So we only did two songs with this new guy, Charlie Pride. And Cowboy did two songs himself. So he, if, if he didn't get a deal with the guy, he was going to have a record for himself to put out. So, so all was not going to be lost. But he took the tape and... Uh, it was a song that Mel Tillis had written. It's kind of a strange title. Uh, I'm sure some of you probably heard it. Maybe everybody, because Charlie Pride was sold more records than Elvis, anybody except Elvis Presley of RCA. But uh, this song is called The Snakes Crawl at Night. Not the one I'm going to play, but uh, we, we cut The Snakes Crawl at Night and, and something else I don't recall the other one. But, but Cowboy took the songs to Chet Atkins to play for him. and, and Chet listened and he liked, he said, I like his singing. He said, but he was a little skeptical, you know. He said, I, I think I'm going to pass, Cowboy. So Jack took the record on, he, he pitched it around, and he had a deal pending about a week later, and Chet called him again. And he said, Cowboy, have you done anything with that, that black singer you got? Have you made a deal yet? And he said, well, no, but I'm fixing to sign a deal tomorrow. He said, would you bring it by one more time and let me listen just once more? He said, I, I have a feeling I may be passing up another Elvis. Uh, how about that for uh, insight? Because he would have been. Elvis Presley sold a million, I mean, a hundred million records, uh, albums and records on RCA, and Charlie Pride sold over 70 million. So nobody came close to that on RCA, and not in the country in the music field. But this song is uh, one we did. We recorded this song three times, actually. It was in an album in 1966. And I think it was one of Charlie's early favorite songs, and I'd come up with this idea for the little intro, and and we did it, and then we uh, I went with uh, Charlie to to do the, his first network television appearance, which was in 1967, on the uh, Lars Welk show on ABC. And I, I, at first, I had said no, I can't do it, because I, I, in those days, the the first call session players, we were doing three and four sessions a day seven days a week sometimes, and I was usually, by the first of the year, we were booked, the top players were booked four and five months in advance, 40, 50 sessions already before we started. So uh, I had so many sessions on the book, and Jack Clement asked me if I'd go do the show with him. He says, it's important, you know, it's Charlie's first network appearance. And I, said, I said, well, I can't do it. I'm, I just can't cancel out sessions. And so uh, a few minutes later, Charlie called, him, called me himself. And I told him the same thing. I said, Charlie, I'd love to record with you, but I just don't go on the road. I can't do it. And they both accepted it reluctantly. And, and about 15 minutes later, I had a call from Chet Atkins. <laughs> so <laughs> now Chet, you know, he was the biggest uh, wheel of the, of the wheels in Nashville. I mean, he was a world famous guitar player, but he was he was a major uh, producer. I mean, he he had more credibility, I think. I mean, he was a uh, a real icon to everybody. And he was a really brilliant man, and uh, but he, uh, he he put it to me this way. He said, "Lord, I understand you've turned down you know Cowboy and uh, and Charlie about going to the Welk show." He said, "But let me tell you," he said, "this is important to Charlie's career." And he said, "You're his security blanket." He said, "And we at RCA would consider it a real favor if you would do this for us." Now, when he's the way he stressed the word "we," I I said, "What? When do we leave?" <laughs> <laughs> so, so I canceled out a, 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 but a week, half a week of sessions to go, and it was a wonderful experience, by the way. And that that uh, video, it was filmed in 35 millimeter film in those days, and, and so it survived and never been shown. But twice it was shown that when it was filmed, and then once more it was repeated that summer, and then it got lost. And a friend of mine who's no longer with us, who was a real big steel fan he knew everything about what I'd done but he didn't know this story and I told him and he called California and 
and was able to get in touch with Lars Welk's former secretary, who still worked for the Welk brothers two days a week. She was in her late 80s, I think, at the time. And she, he befriended her, and she sent guys down to, into the vaults and found the, the original copy, and it's, it's, so it's resurfaced, and now the Country Music Hall of Fame also has a copy, and it's been used. And, and it was used in the um, uh, uh, television show uh, just that was recently shown uh, that, uh, about Charlie Pride uh, on PBS, and uh, but this this was a song that uh, so we we did this song on the show, and then there was a, we did the live at Panther Hall album in 1968, which is a, a kind of a milestone for at least steel players and, and if they play commercial stuff, and uh, we we did it again on that one. So there's three versions of of this song, and so. It's probably more well known than a lot of the other Charlie Pride stuff, even though it was not number one record. It was number eight in 1966. And, uh, but it's uh, just between you and me. sessions. I, we had a, a, a great jazz station in Nashville that I listened to when I'd go home. And then from work at 1.30 or 2 in the morning, and, and there was an easy listening station, but there was an incredible jazz player named Wes Montgomery who really captured my attention. And he had uh, he had this sound with a, a, two unison notes and, and uh, it's sort of a whip-like effect. And, and I, I kept listening to this I'd hear him every night almost because he was really played a lot on the jazz station. And it was the ones that just responded, that you know how great he was. And and I, I wondered how it would translate to steel guitar. And so I tried it, and it was a little tough to find a pocket for it to work with the action of the knee lever. I mean, the floor pedals and and when you hit the strings. And anyhow, it's a whole combination of little things that have to work together. But I cut this song. Uh, it was the last instrumental that was uh, of any significance on on the Billboard charts. It, I was on mine, but records by the time, and they were uh, handled by CBS. But CBS also, uh, they already had a pop version of this um, uh, by a guy named uh, Johnny Nash, I guess. Uh, and he, uh, the promotion people weren't going to work an instrumental very hard, but. But this thing still got to number 36, my version did, and the album reached number 11 in the charts. But the song was uh, unique, and but I, I never, nobody ever was able to, most of the styles I came up with, everybody started playing them, and we, everybody, we were notorious thieves, you know, all the steel players. If somebody came up with something unique, then you heard everybody putting it on records. And, but this one wasn't too translatable, so uh, it was a short-lived thing, but it's, it's an interesting song I can see clearly now.
the, the Johnny Nash record, by the way, sold a million and a half. Mine sold about 50,000, which is a major difference. But that wasn't bad for a country record, even with a singer in the uh, mid-70s, I guess. Um, I, think, I think we should, at this point, you know, we've uh, pretty much, uh, we, we should uh, have Rob, Rob come up and uh, have uh, Trey, uh, Trey come up and sing a song, would you? We got a couple more first. Are you tired? No. <laughs> oh, do we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, yeah, well, I guess I should play Fairwood Park. No, no, I think, well, let's just not play it and see what happens. <laughs> uh, I might, you know, it's obvious, you know, steel players, uh, you can see Paul Frank and all the guys. I mean, but you don't get much emotional expression when you see steel players except in between the lines sometimes because this darn thing is so damn difficult to play. <laughs> um, and we don't have any room to move around, you know, guitar players, they can jump all over the place. And bass players, if, I mean, Jimmy Lee, if he wanted to, man, he's a, he's a showman. <laughs> and, you know, everybody can move around except steel players and keyboard players. So we're, we're pretty much locked into what we're doing. But we still enjoy it. I mean, I'm, I love to play, of course. Um, but this next song, and then, is um, uh, in, in the era of when we were cutting this stuff, uh, I think this song was um, released in 1978. And uh, Gene Watson was a, is a great singer, was uh, one of the better country singers. And uh, the, the way we, uh, they operated the record companies, he was on uh, Capitol Records at the time, major label. <laughs> And they, don't, they didn't want to um, pay overtime for a session. They wanted the three hours, they wanted everything crammed in, you know, so they didn't have to. The, the budgets were a lot more restricted than they later became. And we had, uh, I, that was one of those four session days. We cut 10 and 2 p.m. with, with uh, Gene Watson at Sound Emporium Studio. And, and it was 10 minutes till 5 in the afternoon. I had a 6 and 10 with Don Williams that night. And, uh, and so Russ Reeder, the producer, and, and uh, Gene came over and said, look, we just got one more song, we need one more to finish the album. And could you just do it, let's do one take until we'll have an album complete. They didn't care, they just, it was a filler, it was supposed to be a filler for the album. And I said, sure, you know, so Harold Bradley was leader on the session, and, and we had Gene sing the song, one verse, and a chorus, and we decided I'd play the intro and the turn around and do a modulation, and. And it became, and we did it one take, and we could have worked three weeks or a month on it, and it would have never come off this good if we'd have thought about it. You know, it was just, you, you got musicians that were really, we finally tuned because we'd been working all day, so we were, we were alert, and uh, it was, it was uh, one of those magical moments. Farewell Party is uh, one of the best records I ever played on Gene. It was certainly one of the best four or five singers I ever recorded with, I think. But here's, here's a shortened version of Farewell Party. I played the solo that I played at the very end of the song. Two, three, four, one, two. Well, we gonna start with the intro. Intro, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, the intro comes first. <laughs> two, three,
Now that, that's almost the last song we're going to play before we get Rob and Trey to come up and do a couple of songs I get to do with them, which is going to be a real treat for me. But this, this next one, I'm only going to play the solo I played on the record. Uh, I had, uh, I retired one time for 15 years. I, I just did. I had an inner ear problem, and uh, so I, I was able to retire, so I did. And my late wife and I, we just traveled around the world. I'd, I'd play some in Europe, but I, I never went back into the recording studio for 15 years. And, and uh, But I, I got well after about a year. The inner ear disorder cleared up. But I, I kept getting calls from people occasionally. You know, people want me to come back and record. They wanted that sound in the 60s and 70s. And, and I kept saying no. And But finally, I decided, Russ and I had become friends in the meantime. He, he went to work for Don Williams before he came a, became a prominent studio player. And so he was, he, 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 we became friends. He, he knew all the stuff I'd played on Don's records on the Dobro and Steel. And I shouldn't even say the Dobro word, but it's from Rob Ikes here. <laughs> I, I realize. But um, he, he, uh, he knew I wanted to come back to sessions, so, and I made the decision to, so he took me around to sessions and he said, now you just be quiet, just sit and look and listen now, because technology's changed. We went, had gone from the analog world of tape to digital by the time I came back. Everything was a different kind of recording technology. And so I was like, I just, uh, Rip Van Winkle just woke it up after 40 years. <laughs> And um, my first session, my first album was with Alan Jackson, uh, Keith Stegall, the producer. His secretary called me. She said, we know you're coming back to sessions, and, and uh, Alan wants you for the very first thing you do. We want you before you cut with anybody else. I, and she said, whatever it takes, we'll, we'll get you. We'll, we'll do it. I, well, that was pretty enticing, you know, <laughs> seductive. So my first session back, actually, turned into disaster. It was an album, uh, a Christmas album that uh, Alan Jackson cut. And became a jazz album. Pitt was sick and, uh, and he couldn't do it. It would have been country if he had been there. But the great Matt Rollins was playing the keyboard on it. And it, it his personality, it, it became a jazz album. And uh, I had steel solos and fills and things all over the album originally. But when the album came out, all the steel was gone and there was one Dobro solo left, I think. And they had taken my solos and, and put 50 background vocals on and strings, a uh, string section from Canada. So I was replaced by a lot of people. They didn't need all that. And Alan told me during that album, though, my, my point is that he said, you know, Paul's my favorite player. I mean, I use him on everything and almost. And he said, uh, and he said, I've already cut this song, but he said, my favorite instrumental ever was. Uh, what you played on Gene Wesson's uh, farewell party. And he said, I'm writing a song I want you to cut with me. Now, I want another farewell party so well. And I said, well, I said, I can't promise you anything like that. But I said, you write it, and I'll, I'll play you the best I, I've got. It'll be original, and it'll be good. And he wrote Remember When, and uh, it was uh, uh, we recorded in 2003. And uh, obviously, it was number one record. Everything Alan was, cut, was going number one. But it was uh, it, just coincidentally the last major steel solo uh, on a major record. Uh, John Huey had uh, just a short time before that cut Look at Us with Vince Gill, which was one of the great steel solos of all times. And uh, I, I told uh, Alan and, and Keith Stegall, I said, if you're going to feature me on this solo, then let's make a cameo appearance out of it. I'll stay out of the way and I'll just kind of be in the shadows and I'll come up. And I, on the the lights can be turned on when I play the solo, and then I disappear again. So that's what we did. And uh, I, there, there's no point in playing the song, uh, but I'll play the solo for you. Because <laughs> the song doesn't have a whole lot of. Uh... What if Alan's here? <laughs> well, if Alan's here, he could sing it, but uh... he's not here. Alan, who? Oh, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs>
think I've uh, just about worn my welcome out with Stu. We, we need to get Rob, Rob Bikes up here now. And, oh, no, and Trey. Uh, of course, Trey's going to sing a Ricky Skaggs song, I think. I didn't get to play any of the Ricky Skaggs uh, songs. I, I got to play with Ricky on most of, all, all the albums, but, but not... Uh, uh, Ricky, uh, Bruce Bowden was a steel player, but Ricky used me on anywhere from two to six songs on every uh, album. And this is one of the songs that I got to cut with him. It was a number one record. It's a beautiful tune that Trey's going to sing. Uh, you got to have a mic. <laughs> Well, I, I did a good job of uh, announcing it, but we're going to do uh, a Don Williams song for yeah. Rob's going to play uh, the parts I played. Uh, and I'm gonna, uh, and, but he, he's so, he's, this is a real, this is worth the entire evening for me just to get to do this with Rob and, and, and with Trey, this is special. So this is to uh, to the river, to the rivers run dry. Right. Sing a song now that uh, Lloyd played on with Ricky Skaggs, and I don't have anything to say about it.